Amen. Well, Summer at the Gathering is also a time where we do a teaching series called Summer at the Gathering. And Summer at the Gathering is, a, is an opportunity for us to uh, share what God's placing on our hearts at the moment. Or for me, what I do is we, we plan our teaching schedule and our series about a year in advance. And we do that for a lot of reasons. One reason is I do a lot of research, and I like to have time to research, knowing what, I, what we're kind of moving towards. Another reason is that I have severe ADHD, and without a plan, ain't nothing going to happen. Okay, I need to know what's coming next. And uh, one of the things that I do throughout the year is write down notes in my notes app on my phone of sermon ideas for Summer at the Gathering. Things that the Spirit is speaking to me, teaching me, or things I'm really interested in that I want to talk about but that don't fit into a specific series or I ran out of time for in a series. And, and then we share them with you. And uh, I'll do that. And Pastor Brandon will come and preach during Summer at the Gathering and share his heart and other communicators on our teaching team. And it's just, it's a great time. I love this series because uh, it, it ends up being a collection of heart messages that our church gets to, to hear and to be a part of. And today, the one that I have planned it came out of a series I did last year. I did a series last year on the book of Acts, uh, the book of Acts. Now, if you've been around the gathering for any period of time, you know that I'm obsessed with the story of the Bible. I love it. I love the history in the Bible. I'm a history buff anyways. I've memorized total histories on the Roman Empire, uh, the Sith Empire, and the First Age in the Lord of the Rings. I got all of it, okay? Okay. I'm, I'm always studying some kind of history, but my favorite is biblical history, the histories contained in scriptures, these stories of people who really walked on our earth and interacted with God and the way it helps us learn about who we are today and, and the way that we can learn about the way God interacts with his people and who he's called his people to be from the histories in scripture is, is one of my favorite things to study. And we, we do series sometimes that kind of are of that nature, and we did this series on the book of Acts where we just wanted to understand the story of the early church. If you don't know, if you're new to church and to the Bible, uh, the book of Acts is a, a, a sequel to the Gospels. It was written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a Greek physician, and he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts to the same target audience. He, he penned them to someone named Theophilus, who was likely a Hellenistic Jew, a leader in the church at that time. And he sent them around the same time, around the same time period. Really, Acts is just a continuation of the story. And so if you read the Gospels, then you get to the end part where Jesus goes up into heaven and you're like, but what, what the heck happens next? Well, just, just move right on over into the book of Acts. And it, it starts right there with Jesus ascending into heaven. And all the people there are like, well, what the heck now? And then you get to see what happens next. And I love that story. And contained inside the book of Acts are all these recollections of what God was doing in this season. You know, it, it's truly it's amazing the way that the church was built and designed. What happened uh, in the Gospels of Jesus and throughout his message was he was setting up a structure. He was beginning to build something. And we call it the church. Jesus called it an ecclesia, which is a, a Greek word that just means the gathering. It's where we got this name. And what we see is Jesus building this model for the church, raising up leaders for the church, coming up with a plan for his gospel to reach every corner of the earth and every generation through the church. And in the book of Acts, we see the movement from what Jesus began to what we do here today. Within the story of Acts is this crucial moment within the early church. Jesus selected 12 people from among his followers to be his disciples. And he, he selected these disciples who would be the leaders of the church after his ascension into heaven. In Acts chapter 6, we begin to see them select more leaders and build a structure that could scale and grow along with the early church. Stephen is one of those leaders, and Stephen is our subject today. We're going to talk about someone who, in the book of Acts, receives a couple chapters, which is kind of a lot of real estate for a story that big. And Stephen was selected as a leader in the early church. Today's message is entitled, Lessons 
from a martyr. And Stephen was the very first martyr, martyr of the Christian church. His story is a turning point for the church in that age, the first century Roman Empire. And from the story of Stephen, I believe there is an incredible amount for us to learn. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you his story, what happened, uh, and then I want to give you his sermon, what he preached. He has a a sermon in Acts chapter 7 that is important. And then I want to talk about the lessons that I think he would give us today. What I love to do when I'm studying scripture is imagine if I could sit down with some of these people and just say, what what would you have me learn from what God did in your life? And I want to look at what I think Stephen would say today. So let's begin with the story of Stephen. His story begins in Acts chapter 6. We're introduced to him at a critical point in ministry. Uh, At the time, there's two main groups of people who are following Jesus. This is shortly after the events of Jesus ascending into heaven. And then Acts chapter 2 tells us about what we call Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit descended onto the followers of Jesus. And now the, the disciples and the followers of Christ are all filled with the Holy Spirit. The church grows from 100 people to, to 3,000 people in one day. And the, the church is on the move in the city of Jerusalem. And it's growing. And some months have gone by. And there's two groups of people that are following Jesus. One is the Hebraic Jews. And the other is the Hellenistic Jews. Now, The gospel doesn't really spread to non-Jewish audiences, what the Bible calls Gentiles, until around Acts chapter 10. That That was yet to come. So far, there are only a few people who are Gentiles who are following Jesus. It's mostly these two big groups of Jewish people. Hebraic Jews are Jewish people who had a Jewish culture. They were raised in or around Judea. Uh, they had a, a temple lifestyle. They, they built not just their belief, but their whole life around a Jewish life. Hellenistic Jews were Jewish by faith, but Greek by culture. They lived in Greek cities and Greek towns. They often had Greek names. This was the primary language of the time was, was Greek, even in this portion of the Roman Empire and And so there was a lot of people who were living in a very Greek culture. However, the Hellenistic Jews separated themselves from Greek culture in that they were devout Jewish people. They still worshipped God, served God only, but they had a, a, a Greek culture. Oftentimes, Hellenistic Jews were looked down on and ostracized by Hebraic Jews. There's a long story about why, but it was just built into the people of Judea that they were not supposed to have a culture outside of their faith. And they still were holding on to that and kind of keeping these people at arm's distance. As a result of this, when these two different groups both began following Jesus and were trying to be the church together, well, it led to some complicated moments. Because often when two different kinds of people are trying to follow Jesus together, there's a lot of tension to figure out there. The Hellenistic Jews felt that they were being overlooked in the distribution uh, of food and such to their widows and their orphans. One of the things the early church did right away was begin to care for people who needed someone to care for them. And the Hellenistic Jews thought they were being overlooked. The disciples, who had all come from Hebraic Jewish backgrounds, they just realized that they weren't able to take care of everyone by themselves. They had blind spots. They weren't able to do the work they had been called to do, which was to build and lead the church and also pastor and care for all the people who were now following them. They were being asked to make every decision as the leaders of this movement, but they didn't have the capacity for all the decisions that needed to be made. And so they selected some leaders in order to have these people rise up and care for the people. These men were called deacons at the time. Stephen was one of them. And the apostles led the church and the deacons cared for and pastored the people. Now among these deacons, Stephen, he really stood out. Acts chapter 6 gives us the list in verse 5. It says, They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, 
Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, which is a big deal. It's the first convert to Judaism who receives leadership in the church of Jesus. And you'll notice that the only person in this list of men who has a description of his character is Stephen. Now, to be selected as these leaders, to care for these people, it was a very big deal. Everyone on this list had an incredible character, was known for their faith, but Stephen stood out. Have you ever met anyone that just stands out? You just, you get around him and you're like, oh goodness, something is different about his faith. I feel like I've got a strong faith, but that guy's faith is different. The way that God's going to use him is different. That guy is nice on a whole different level. He doesn't even have mean thoughts when people walk away. He's a different kind of person, and that is how Stephen is. That's how we're meant to receive him. Right after this, it says that because of this selection of these leaders, the church began to grow and spread like a wildfire. It's a good reminder to us that when the church has the right people in the right places, and when the work and the ministry of the church doesn't just rest on one person, the church grows. We often say here at the gathering that the church is not just me and the people you see up here on stage. It's all of us working together using the gifts that God placed within us to make a difference here in our city. When you step into your purpose and serve alongside the church as a part of the body of Christ, we can change our city. Stephen serves as a leader here and rises up as a notable pastor in his community. Stephen's rise and his what God is doing in him gets the attention of the Jewish leaders who are out there trying to stop Christianity. Verse 8 says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And then then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They began to lie about him. So, Stephen was arrested. And he was brought to trial before the Jewish court, which was called the Sanhedrin. And that's where he delivers his famous speech or sermon that's in chapter 7. The Bible says that right before he gave this speech, his face shone like an angel. And right after, he looked up and he saw heaven open up and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. After he gave his speech, and then he said that he saw Jesus, the Sanhedrin were enraged. They called him a blasphemer and they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him to death. Just before he died, He repeated the words of Jesus on the cross. Lord, receive my spirit. And Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And the story tells us at the end that Saul, who would later become Paul, was there giving this whole event his approval. Stephen would be the first of Jesus' followers to be martyred. His story has given strength to thousands since who have given their lives in Jesus' name. And it stands today as a reminder of both the cost and the value of following Jesus. So what was it that, Jesus, that Stephen said in the Sanhedrin that led to this response from his accusers to such violence, unprecedented violence? Let's talk about that. The Sermon of Stephen. Stephen was standing before the Jewish high court made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, the two ruling teachers of the law of the Jewish world at the time. And this was like their supreme court with the two different sects, and they called it the Sanhedrin. This was the same court that Jesus stood in just a few months before. The same court that convicted him had him sent to the Romans to be put to death. Both of these groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were obsessed with the law of Moses. You see, several hundred years before this happened, this moment in time, the presence of the Lord dwelt in the temple. 
And in the temple was the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the place where God's Shekinah glory, his presence physically seen and felt, rested. The leaders of the Jewish faith would come and approach the presence of God on behalf of the people and the whole faith was built around it. But during what's called the exile, which took place a few hundred years before Jesus, when Jerusalem was invaded and overrun and all the people of God were cast out, the temple was destroyed. And though they did rebuild the temple and a temple stood still at this time and in the time of Stephen, the temple was a new temple that did not have the Ark of the Covenant within it. The Ark was gone, was missing, lost. And so the presence of God no longer rested in the place of the temple. And so the, the followers or the, the leaders uh, of the Jewish faith, these, these teachers of the law, they would try to fill this void missing from the presence of God with the law and the teachings of Moses. And they clinged to them desperately. In the absence of the presence of God, they just clung to the rules of God. Jesus came and brought the presence of God back to his people in a more intimate way than ever thought possible, made possible by his death and resurrection. But these Jewish leaders wouldn't understand that. And so they clung on to their laws. Jesus claims that the laws were fulfilled in him and that the prophets were about him challenged not just what they believed in, but their very identity, their world view was wrapped up around the laws of Moses. The laws of Moses were everything to them. They, they were who these men are, who they were. And so that is why they reacted so violently to Jesus and why they would react so violently to Stephen here. Because not only did they feel that he was speaking against what they believed, they felt that he was speaking against who they were. Had these men understood what Jesus was teaching, as some Pharisees did, like Nicodemus or Joseph or Paul, then these men could have been set free as well. Jesus said that he came to set us free, not from living a life that was set apart for God, which is what the laws were designed to help us do, but free from being bound to those laws and burdened by them. But for these men standing in front of Stephen, they just couldn't understand any of that. And so they were bound to these laws. They accused Stephen of blasphemy and asked him to answer to the accusations of blasphemy, gave him his moment to speak. And so that's what he did. He stood in front of them and it says that his face shone like an angel. And he began a sermon by stretching all the way back in his people's history to the story of Abraham. He recounted the history of their people, one that everyone in that room would have known intimately. He told the story of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, and then he went into Moses. Moses, who wrote the law, who was the chief idol for these Jewish leaders. And through this whole story, Stephen weaved a central theme. The theme was that God, in his people's history, would call up a leader, and then the people would reject him. God would have a plan for the people's salvation, but the people would not follow it. God would reveal something to his people, and his people would miss it. Here's an excerpt from the sermon. Verse 35. Chapter 7. This is the same Moses they had rejected. With the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself. Through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt. At the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. 
Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back towards Egypt. Stephen's message here was very clear to the people listening. They were trapped in a pattern. Just as their ancestors had doubted Moses, who these men now worshipped, these men were doubting Jesus. But Jesus is God's plan. They just missed it as they had a history of doing. This message that God is constantly revealing things to his people that his people are missing and rejecting is a message that still cuts into the heart of us today. Because so many of us have a history of missing the things that matter the most. We have access to the gospel, but instead we make idols out of our money, our relationships, our power, our jobs, our hobbies. We make idols out of anything that we can. We turn our hearts from God and we give them to other things when the very key to feeling the satisfaction that we've always wanted was always right here in a relationship with Jesus. Stephen brings this message and it's very direct and it's very clear. Just as you and your ancestors missed it with Moses, so you here in this room have missed it with Jesus. He is the one that Moses told us about. He is the one that was foretold that you know all the prophecies of the Messiah and they've been fulfilled. But you're missing it just like the people missed it before. And this message enraged the members of the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees and the Sadducees thought the audacity of this man to compare Jesus to Moses. It brought up rage inside of them. So their immediate response is to drag him from the Sanhedrin all the way through the city. A long walk outside the city gates where they would throw him on the ground and stone him to death. So what are we to learn from this martyr? His lesson. What does he teach us today? If I were to sit with Stephen and ask him what he would want me to understand, here's what I believe he would say. First, there will always be those who don't get it. There will always be those who don't get it. Stephen never hurt anyone. He didn't stand in front of the temple shouting out against and provoking the Jewish leaders. Stephen was never intentionally divisive or controversial. What we know about him is that he served widows. He healed the sick. He shared the gospel of Jesus with anyone who would listen. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was obvious to those who saw him. This upset people who disagreed with him. And didn't believe in Jesus. And so they began to argue with him. But even in those moments, the Holy Spirit gave him power to answer those arguments. And this made these people so angry that they began to lie about him. And to lie about his character. When he was accused, he gave a compelling sermon showing them that what they believed about Jesus was wrong. Just as their ancestors had been wrong to doubt Moses. He showed them that their people had constantly missed God's plans, and that was exactly what had happened with Jesus. But it didn't matter. Their minds didn't change. They just got angrier. There's an important lesson here. Some minds won't change. All throughout the story of the Bible, we see people who just don't believe. Minds that just don't change. The Israelites wouldn't listen as the prophets tried to warn them about the exile as it was coming. They wouldn't repent even while the world was falling apart all around them. There was a prophet named Jeremiah who had told them trouble was coming and then when it came they still wouldn't listen to him. And he writes, they did not obey or incline their ear but they walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and they went backward and not forward. The reality is sometimes people won't stop working against you. They won't hear the logic in your argument. They won't understand the heart behind it. They won't receive the gift you're trying to give. We have to make peace with that reality. And we have to love people anyways. 
And we have to continue to share the gospel with the full awareness that there are those who will never receive it. When we deliver the gospel to somebody, as we are commanded and called to do, in fact, the command of Jesus is to share the gospel with anyone that we can, with anyone that we would interact with, even with those sometimes that won't listen. When we deliver the gospel to someone, it is not our responsibility, it's not our job to make them receive it. We have a responsibility to share and to share as often as possible and with as many people as possible, to have a a boldness in the way that we share knowing that it is just our role to share the gospel, not our role to make someone believe in, receive, hear, and understand the gospel. Jesus said in John chapter 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I want to release you of a burden this morning. For some of us, we feel compelled to share the gospel, but we have this great fear inside of us. What if I mess it up? What if I stumble all the way through it? What if my words aren't good enough? What if the way that I communicate it doesn't land? What if I, what if, what if I, what if I get it all wrong? What if they don't believe? What if they don't listen to me? Maybe you shared the gospel and you were met with criticism. You were met with anger. You were met with fear. In this city, oftentimes you reveal your belief, your Christianity to somebody and you are met with hostility. Maybe you've experienced that. And it's made you feel like you don't want to do that ever again. But when you share Jesus with someone, there are three roles. There's your role to share. There is the Holy Spirit's role to help them receive. And then there's the role of the hearer to respond and listen. All three have to work together for someone to change. When I share the gospel with you, the Holy Spirit has to draw you to the gospel. And then you have to make a choice to receive it. These Pharisees either weren't being drawn by the Spirit or they just chose not to hear the gospel from Stephen this day. Whatever the reason, it was not Stephen's fault. He was obedient to the Holy Spirit's movement in him, even to the point of his death. He didn't fight back against these people in a way that was malicious or mean. When they lied about him, he didn't lie back about them. He stood his ground. And he shared the gospel and he shared it again. We cannot control the way people respond when we share the gospel. Some people will never get it. Even so, we should share the gospel with boldness as much and as often as possible, even to people that we don't think will receive it. Because it is not our responsibility to decide who can and cannot receive the gospel. It is not our responsibility to decide whether or not they're worthy of it, ready for it, whether or not they'll be mean to us. It is our responsibility to share the gospel. To tell people about our faith. To tell them what God has done in our lives. To share the testimony of our redemption as many times and as often as possible with anyone who we can get to listen for a moment. And those who won't listen, we can't make them listen. And those who do listen and reject it, we can't control their responses. But we are still called to share it. And when it doesn't go the way we want it to go, we all want that moment where we get to see someone understand the power and the hope of the gospel for the first time, but when it doesn't work out, we don't walk away thinking, I've ruined this person's eternity. We walk away thinking, I've done what I was called to do. The the rest of it is up to God and up to them. That's what Stephen did. Stephen had had no reason to believe that these men would change their minds, but he preaches the gospel in much the same way that Peter did in Acts chapter 2 when he shares the gospel with a similar message and 3,000 people get saved. It's not our job to make people respond. It's just our job to share it. Number two, from Stephen we can learn that life doesn't always work out the way you want it to. 
Stephen lived a good life, and he was a good man, and he died a violent death. If we are being honest, the life of Stephen kind of stands in defiance for how a lot of us think a Christian life should go. Living in a country like this one where we're free to worship without fear of penalty or death has done a lot of great things for our faith over the years, but it has also done some serious damage. We've gained this false sense of security. We've allowed a theology to develop and spread that says, God will keep me safe. God will make my life good the way I define good. God will bless me the way that I define blessing. We get our minds wrapped up in this idea that a Christian life should be a good, happy, peaceful life where God turns every light green and every cloud into sun. But then inevitably... We face a rainy day. Things go sideways. Someone who should have lived dies. Something that should have worked out falls through. Someone you love lets you down. The doctor calls with news that just doesn't make sense. And if our faith is wrapped up in this American Christian prosperity gospel, it's severely shaken by these moments. Or instead of leaning into a moment of suffering and learning and growing from it, or even just leaning into a moment of suffering to allow ourselves to mourn and to suffer. Instead, we just keep telling ourselves, it's okay, everything's going to work out. This will pass. But things don't always pass. Stephen helps us learn this lesson. More than once, The story tells us that Stephen was a man full of faith. He was full of God's grace and power. And yet here, he meets a violent end. Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean everything is going to work out okay. Jesus told us this much. Over and over, he said that there would be a cost to following him. That if we wanted to follow him, we would have to be prepared to lay down our lives and follow him. In America, we often translate that to mean we're going to have to put down some of our desires and our dreams in order to follow Jesus and make his dreams our dreams. But the very real truth that Jesus was communicating to the people there is that you may also have to lay down your actual life in order to follow me. Many of the people who heard that message from Jesus would be martyred and killed, as most of his followers and disciples were in the first century. So, I'm telling you about Stephen and his message that sometimes people don't change, and sometimes it just doesn't work out in the end. And I imagine you're feeling very encouraged at church today. But what I really think is that this story of Stephen is one of the most encouraging stories in the book of Acts. And I'll tell you why. Because in this story, as in every story where we see pain and suffering at the center, God is still on the throne. Stephen reminds us that it is not our responsibility to make people listen. He reminds us that just because things didn't go according to plan, can can you imagine Stephen in this moment? No one had ever been killed for following Jesus except for Jesus. Perhaps he thought he'd be arrested and he'd have to continue his ministry in jail. Perhaps he thought he would be released, be able to continue doing what God he felt had created and called him to do, serving in the purpose and the dreams that he had for his life. But it didn't go that way. At the end of this moment of bold faith, he was dragged all the way through the city. Oh, the fear that he must have felt. The wondering. And yet, just before he left the Sanhedrin, he was given a reminder that each one of us gets to internalize here today. God is still on the throne. Stephen reminds us that just because things don't go according to plan doesn't mean we got something wrong or that we're being punished by God or that God forgot about us. 
is this is the side effect of the theology that we often kind of internalize here in America, evangelical Christianity. That if our life doesn't work out, if we aren't healed, if the people we love aren't healed, if we don't receive the blessing, if we give out of our finances, but then we don't all of a sudden receive financial blessing, if we, we do these things and it doesn't go how we dream it will go, we internalize the idea that we're doing something wrong. Our faith isn't strong enough, or we must have angered God, or our sin is too big for Him to overlook. We must have messed it up. But that's not the truth we see in Scripture. We live in a fallen world where there is brokenness and heartache, pain and death. Our role as followers of Jesus is to bring hope and joy into this fallen world through the gospel of Jesus. One day, all of this brokenness, all of it, will be healed. This world will be healed. But until that day comes, things are going to go wrong. People are going to refuse to believe. Things are not always going to work out. But God will remain on the throne. He reminded Stephen of that in his final moments. Verse 55, Stephen finishes his sermon. And it says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. It's the only time in all of Scripture where Jesus is described as standing at the right hand of God rather than sitting. It's like he was honoring the sacrifice that Stephen made that day. Here's what I would say to you in light of Stephen. When you follow Jesus and serve him, you will have greater peace, satisfaction, and true joy than you could experience in any other way in this life. It's the only way you will ever feel whole because it's the purpose you were created for. That I can promise you because it's the reality I live in every day. But you will also find that not every day is sunshine and rainbows. Not everything works out. Some things are hard. Sometimes you will have bad days because of your faith. Sometimes your faith will make life harder for you. Jesus told us that. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's the key. Jesus has overcome the world. The reminder he gave Stephen in this moment that would have been a moment of fear, a moment of doubt, a moment of questioning, Stephen is able to see Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, to be reminded, to be reminded that he has overcome the world and he will overcome this moment as well. Romans eight twenty eight. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We misunderstand this verse a lot. We think that this is the reason. We think, well, everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be good. God's going to make it good for me. My life is going to be good. Whatever bad things I'm facing, I just have to ignore those because God's going to make it good. And that's true. But maybe not in the way you're thinking. Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. Paul was beheaded in Rome for his faith in Jesus. The church that he wrote this letter to was being persecuted by the Emperor Nero, who was killing them by the dozens, and then by the Emperor Diocletian, who did the same. He didn't mean everything's going to be great all the time. What he meant was God is still on the throne. Paul was trying to tell us, and Stephen would have told us, that God did work things out for good in their circumstances. 
both because of those who would be encouraged and empowered by the news of their martyrdom. When Stephen is martyred, it creates a wildfire in the church. People are not cowering away in fear and trembling. Instead, they are emboldened even more to speak out for their faith, to share the word of God, to say that Jesus is alive. They're more emboldened than ever before. Why? Because God is still on the throne. Paul and Stephen saw things work out for good because of how people were empowered by their martyrdom, but also because they got to be with Jesus. Jesus overcame this world, and now because of him, so can we. The brokenness of this world is not the end of the story for us. God is working things together for good according to his purpose. His purpose is to make it on earth as it is in heaven. That is his purpose. And he's called all of us, conscripted us to service, to join him in that work, to spread the gospel as far as we can so that we make it, may make it on earth as it is in heaven, that more and more people may serve the kingdom of God, that more and more people may know of the kingdom of God, and so that one day when the kingdom of heaven collides with this earth, when we are made new and, and renewed in Jesus' name, the kingdom would be more and more filled with his people because we have been bold in our faith on good days and bad days and times when people would listen and when they wouldn't to share of that faith, to communicate that gospel and to say Jesus is alive and Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and, and we can come to the Father through him and when we do this, when we share this message, we make it on earth as it is in heaven and it will all be good for the Father when it is on earth as it is in heaven. When God says he's going to make everything good for you, he doesn't mean necessarily the way you think it's good. He means the way he knows it's good. Good for the kingdom. Not always good for my immediate moment. He's going to make it on earth as it is in heaven. And on my lowest days, when things are not working out, when they're not going good, when things aren't right, I'm reminded of this, and I remember that God is so good that he gave a picture of this to his apostle John that he recorded for us in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And on your worst moments, oh, when things are falling apart, may you be encouraged by the good that is to come. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I, John, saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle the presence of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold. I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. Bad days will come. People won't listen. People will reject you, come against you, fight you. Your life will fall apart sometimes. 
the brokenness of this world will fold its way into your home. But on those days, you have to remember that God is on the throne. And he is going to make all things new. And when we serve him, when we work with him, when we join and partner alongside of him to build up the kingdom of heaven, to make it on earth as it is in heaven here, when we share his gospel, we can receive a greater hope. What Paul called it, a peace that surpasses all understanding. We can receive greater satisfaction, greater joy than we could anywhere else in this world and in this life because God is on the throne and he will always remain on that throne. And because he is, it will all be good in the end. Now if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, well, this is my hard sell. Your life's, <laughs> it's still gonna have bad days. But the promise that I can make to you is that you will be able to face those days with a greater hope than has ever been available to you before. The promise that I can make to you is that the purpose you were created with would now be available, awake, open to you. That you can have greater meaning than you ever knew possible in this life. Greater peace, greater joy than you ever knew was possible in this life. Serving Jesus will not be easy, but it will be the greatest thing you've ever done. If you're ready to enter into that relationship, every head bowed, every eye closed, would you pray this prayer with me? (laughs) Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Oh, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for trying to do it on my own. I believe in you. I believe in your death and your resurrection. And today I receive the hope that only you can give. All that I am from this day forward, I am yours. I will follow you. In Jesus' name.